afternoon, everyone. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to October's uh, Brown Bag. Um, want to? This is going to be a little bit different one today. We are it's going to be a rapid fire kind of atmosphere with some posters that were um, taken on a to Calgary, Alberta, Canada um, earlier this year, and the presenters will come up. They your slides will be up here. You got three minutes to talk about your part of your slide. If you got multiple author, authors or presenters with that. I will be your timekeeper, so if I give you the high sign or something like that, it means move right along. So I'm going to kind of keep this on, on track, so that's my duty today. Um, I introduce myself. My name is Vern Farr. Uh, I work at UMC, and I'm the current um, president for the LCU Nursing Alumni, so this is my privilege to come and um, introduce and welcome everybody to the Research Brown Bag this month. So let us go ahead and get started. Uh, Kelly. We'll move on. Uh, Katie, are you here? There you are. Three you got three minutes. <laughs> you got to keep me on topic. Okay. And this is just for the recording of the for this. Oh, okay. so, not, so I have to no, use so it. You got to use it a little bit. A little singing. Okay. Well, hi, my name's Katie Hensley. Um, I got to go to STTI in Calgary this year, which was an awesome experience. So if you ever get to go, I highly encourage it. But uh, to move right along, um, so my integrative research review was over if uh, implementing ICU di diary programs in a critical care setting helps decrease post-intensive care syndrome in uh, ICU survivors and or their families. And so a little background and evidence on it is due to the advancement of medicine, um, a lot of people are surviving critical care illness that wasn't 10, 20, 30 years ago. And so because of that, they're surviving. However, they're going on with a whole new challenge to face. And so um, a new term that's out there in the literature is post-intensive care syndrome that was turned by the Society of Critical Care Medicine several years ago. But essentially, some of these ICU survivors are going home with some kind of physical, mental, or cognitive impairment. And so, um, it is suggested that implementing an ICU diary will um, help these people that go home with some of the psychological effects from being in uh, the ICU, will help fill in memory gaps, help decrease PTSD and anxiety and depression in some of these patients. So just for instance, um, some patient testimonies I've read on is um, one lady said once she got out of the ICU, her brain is like Velcro, but things don't stick anymore like they used to anymore. She is also a cancer survivor, and she was asked if you had to go through ARDS and being in the ICU again, or going through cancer and chemo, she would choose cancer and chemo. So that kind of puts things in perspective of what um, these patients are dealing with when they go home, and it's also in their families as well. And so it's... Um, it's, kind of, it's very detrimental, and so um, it's been suggested that ICU diaries, it's just a simple, um, low-cost, low-technology tool of journaling during their ICU stay. It's an interdisciplinary team approach. Everybody um, puts in uh, what may be happening throughout the day, and it's given to the patients when they leave to help fill in those, bridge those memory gaps, because some people go home with these horrible hallucinations. Um, one, one patient stated that he thought the respiratory therapist was trying to cut off his windpipe, but in reality, he was just being suctioned down the ET tube. Um, another patient testimony, and it's, I know there's little ears in here, um, is one lady thought she was being raped repeatedly in a hotel room, when in reality, the nurses, it was when they were turning and cleaning her up. And so you can imagine what kind of maybe trauma you might go home with. So. Um, my research question is, will an intensive care unit diary program decrease symptoms or incidences of PICS in ICU survivors and their families once they're discharged during, uh, tr transferred from the ICU? And so I use Whitmore and Naffel's uh, methodology uh, for integrative research review, and I concluded with 12 articles uh, for my IIR. And uh, I actually found three uh, high-level evidence, uh, systematic reviews, and, several, um, and most of mine were levels uh, four and five on the lower end. And so what the literature actually suggested is there is actually, um, there's something going on here. There's a problem. There is a growing need to help ICU survivors and families cope after critical care in illness once they go home. So they say, hey, there's a problem. It's been identified. Something needs to be done. Um, one of the other big takeaways is that the IC diary program may actually help to decrease PTSD in um, families more so than patients. So, you know, if we're offering patient-centered care, our families are part of that. 
And so, and then the last uh, big synthesis takeaway is an IC diary has potential to help long-term psychological effects for patients. And so the clinical implications for this, if it's something low cost, low technology that might be beneficial for our patients, it's something that might be considered to be standardizing care in a critical care setting. And so uh, overall conclusions is after evaluating the IC diary program may be beneficial in decreasing PTSD symptoms in families and patients. Of course, there needs to be larger, more randomized uh, control trials. Um, in order to truly answer this research question. Thank you very much. Jason Hunter. Sir? Thank you, Mary. Yes, well, I'm Jason, one of the clinical instructors in Medical SU, and I'm fortunate enough to work with Katie um, there in Medical SU at UMC. And my research was over um, patient experience uh, resulting um, specifically related to how the physician and the interdisciplinary team rounds upon them. And so in my medical ICU, we have four different attendings and they round differently in each of the way they like to round. We have some doctors that will just do what's called a hallway round where they'll go room to room to room, they'll discuss the patient right outside the room, and then they'll step in briefly and do like a brief like introduction, kind of update the patient, and then step out. And then there's some physicians that will actually go and take everyone into the room and they all discuss everything within the room. And that takes, you know, the scene is taking a lot of time. And then there's what we call sit down rounds, board rounds, where they're in one room and they're just bring up a computer and they don't see the individual patient and they just talk about the patient um, from the chart perspective. And then later on, the resident is one that goes around and, and rounds individually with the patient. And so we were getting concerns from the nursing staff that um, things were consistent. It was hard to update the patient, saying when the doctor was going to round. And it led to patient experience issues, and so I wanted to pick this topic. And this has actually been a topic that's picking up speed a little bit um, across the nation just because uh, more and more funds related to the patient surveys and their experience and how they're feeling about things. And so we wanted to um, implement something to help improve our patient's experience at the EMC, specifically in our ICU. And so um, I, I looked up and found some reviews. Most of it was level fours and fives. Um, and we looked through there, and it's, you know, Shouldn't be a surprise that most of the higher reviews um, for patients and uh, was related to the physician actually going into the room, spending time with the, the patient, and um, updating. And you know the fears were that well HIPAA. You know what if there's two patients in the room and you're updating and you're talking right about me in front of my family members, my other roommate, whatever. And so that was um, a big concern. And when asked. You know, they had a lot of the surveys, or a lot of these studies had surveys that were sent to the patients uh, in narrative form and, and asking, what do you feel about it? And they said they're perfectly fine with being studied upon. Like, if this is a learning opportunity, they're fine with that. And so, and then another concern for physicians was it's going to take too much time. They're going to go into the room, it's going to take more time. And if the physicians were able to stick to a routine and it can be um, planned, the doctors were actually saving time by going into these rooms and having a uh, predictable schedule so that people didn't, didn't interrupt them during that time. And so it was another thing that they were finding from these studies. Um, and then the best approach was to include uh, interdisciplinary, and so they'd have nurses go in with the doctors, they'd have PT, RT, pharmacy, and you'd have everyone that you needed to go into the room. And, and so that's something that we were bringing at UMC and um, we're talking with our physicians and hopefully gonna implement the study at UMC as well to take it to the next level. Thank you. The next poster will, Midge will not be here. Midge will not be here. Okay. Uh, Jenna Ward. I'm not as good at them. I had to bring a little paper with me, but my name is Jana Warner. I've been a nurse in the NICU for a little over 11 years. Um, and so I chose this topic um, about using probiotics in neonates because of how prevalent neck is in my area. Um, so this is something that we assess for continually through every shift that we um, are in. And um, so I started wondering, you know, is there something that we can do to help prevent this? And if there is, then why are we not doing it? And so um, I want to start first for those that don't work in the NICU um, about explaining what NEC is. NEC stands for necrotizing endocolitis. Um, it is um, associated with bowel uh, wall necrosis. 
It primarily affects premature and ma medically fragile infants and is considered a medical emergency due to the risk of um, bowel wall perforation uh, with approximately 27 to 63 percent requiring surgical intervention. Um, it is one of the leading causes in infant mortality in premature infants with a rate of up to 20 percent and low birth weight infants being um, involved. So my question was, does the probiotic um, decrease the instances of necrotizing and chronize in neonates? Um, so I conducted an integrative review of the literature. I used Cochrane, Sinol, and Medline complete databases, and I used the key terms probiotics, necrotizing endocolitis, and reduction. Um, my search was limited to full text articles uh, between the years of 2013 and 2018. And um, my inclusion criteria um, included preterm infants only, and then specific to probiotic use. Um, my original search identified 32 articles and then using those um, inclusion and exclusion criteria I narrowed it down to 12 articles that were pertinent to my research. So I critically analy analyzed all those using my um, checklist and what I found was that evidence does suggest that probiotic use um, decreases necrotizing intercolitis in premature infants. So. Um, specifically those that were born 1,500 grams or less or under 32 weeks of age. There's very little research on 27 weeks and below. So nine of the 12 articles found significant reduction in neck with use of probiotics um, when they were born less than 32 weeks. Two studies found um, that it was um, statistically insignificant, but they both used the same strand of probiotics um, called Inflorin. And then four articles um, specifically reported the need for more research um, on the strand and dosage that they were using. And then two articles um, talked about feeding differences between breast milk and formula use. So um, in conclusion, probiotics have been shown um, to reduce the significance of neck in premature infants, um, but honestly it left me pretty frustrated because we know this, but we still need more research to know um, the strands that are needed and what dosage to use. So until then, we just encourage breast milk use. sepsis and give us higher hemoglobin levels like throughout uh, the <coughs> at, at birth and throughout like their NICU state and those infants that are born at 32 weeks or less and weighing like 1500 grams are at a higher risk of developing um, <coughs> a, a brain bleed or and so delaying the cord, the delaying cord clamping uh, can can reduce can reduce that. Um, <clears throat> and this is important because any any uh, grade of brain bleed can cause like significant uh, neurological effects on these babies. And delaying the cord clamping is also important because it. Uh, the fetal placental blood volume, it's at birth, it's uh, about a half of the, sorry, I got a little confused here. Um, half of the fetal placenta blood volume in the placenta is at, <clears throat> at the time of birth contains potential useful red cells and stem cells as well as volume, which is important to keep 
the blood, blood pressure stable on these babies and reducing IVH. So um, I found, um, ended up using uh, 12 of the articles that I found because they were related to specifically um, delay court typing. Although there are some of the other articles that I found were more related to, weren't related to preterm babies or um, they talked about uh, court stripping. So in my literature, I found out that, yes, uh, delay core clamping uh, had been, gave us better admission hemoglobin. It reduced the rates of late onset sepsis. It, it uh, gave us higher admission blood pressures and less, and there was a less need for transfusion during the, the baby's hospital stay. Um, it also suggested that increased blood volume provided an improved hemodynamic stability without uh, compromising resuscitation. And maintaining the higher hemoglobin levels in the newborn period also improved neurodevelopmental outcomes. The clinical implications is, were that the studies show that despite uh, the benefits of delay cord clamping, some providers don't do it because they feel like it uh, delays resuscitation of those babies. And more studies need to be done because preterm babies are at higher risk of um, disability, long-term disability, so there needs to be more studies to, uh, <clears throat> to follow up on that. In conclusion, um, the study suggests that delay cord clamping significantly reduces the incidence of IVH. And um, however, the, we still don't know exactly the the number of uh, the amount of time that we need to delay cord clamping to get the most benefits. Good afternoon. My name is Karina Perez. I'm a nursing informatics analyst at University Medical Center. We are a magnet organization and we have had most wire designation for the last three years. I am writing on integrative research review, factors for successful decision support tools and systems. So what does that all mean? Um, CDS, or clinical decision support, is a process of providing filtered, useful, organized information to help clinicians make the best decisions. So you think of the five rights. Is it the right information? Is it going to the right person? Are you using the right intervention? Are you using the right channel? And are you doing it at the right time in the workflow? So why do we care about CDSs? Well, it allows clinicians to access information which may save them time and optimize their workflow. In one study, we found improvements in hemoglobin A1C, better control of systolic and diastolic pressures, improved LDLs, and provider satisfaction. Another study improved mortality, decreased ICU length of stay, and lowered readmission rates. So my question is, is there a criterion for success of CDSs in health outcomes and end user satisfaction. My exclusion criteria for the research, I excluded EHR implementations in commercial settings, multivariables, and anything that lacked outcome performance or user satisfaction. In the literature, I searched peer-reviewed um, articles, and I used um, the terms clinical decision support, electronic health record, and goal. 143 articles were yielded, and due to the gap in recent literature, I had to expand the search to over 10 years. 15 were included in the final sample, um, one level one, one level two, one level three, one level five, and 11 level fours. So here's what we found. There are six items that are important to a successful CDS. So next time you're requesting for a new rule alert, let my system do this, think about these things. 
is it incorporating the clinical workflow as a component of that framework. Local configuration. That means that whatever you're building, it has to do adapt to fit the system and the clinical environment. Usability. Can the user actually use it, or is it just a thought out there that we might be able to use it? Um, the literature was split between being user-centric or patient-centric, and the very last is effective governance. Did the people that were going to be impacted have a stake in making the decision? So in conclusion, emerging themes were prevalent in the frameworks for success. However, continued higher levels of research need to be conducted to support the identified factors. Thank you. that were on this project, and we call it the Evaluation of a Nursing Program Curriculum Redesign, Assessing uh, Millennial uh, Satisfaction and Outcomes. Um, Dr. Ford and I are continuing this study, um, and Kim, unfortunately, because of her PhD studies, has, has backed out, but here's what we have preliminary, preliminarily. Um, we actually did a curriculum redesign a few years ago, so we wanted to see what was the nursing student satisfaction with that and their likelihood to go ahead and go on and pursue higher education, but also to uh, be retained in the workforce. What we found in the review of literature is about 50% of those first year nurses actually leave the bedside. And it's very difficult for us to recruit and retain student nurses at the bedside. So we wanted to see what would make a difference in that if they were more satisfied with their nursing program. So we actually did um, uh, look for several tools. We found one, it was a nursing student satisfaction tool that was tested by Dr. Chen and we received permission to use that tool. And then we wanted to use additional items to see does age make a difference, does being in healthcare make a difference, does their GPA make a difference. So we added a different, another section to this tool to use with it. So what we did is we sent it out to our nursing students in, that had graduated in our new curriculum and we sent it out through their emails. So we sent it out to 228 potential participants in this, and we received 45 uh, results. However, six of them, they didn't complete their survey, and one decided they didn't wanna do it at all. So what we decided is we'll take this back to the IRB and ask that we want to try to uh, push this out through text messaging because a lot of our emails that we had were old emails either from their pre-nursing program, and so we didn't have any, many bounce back, but we're wondering if that's not part of why we didn't, we had such a low response. Even though, I mean, we had, if you had to count that, it's like 19.7% on there. That's but what, yeah, what we did have is 81% are females, 15% um, or about 16% were more males. We did have 44% of them had worked in healthcare one to five years. So did that make a difference in there? Uh, each of the cohorts, we had three to six students about participate in the survey. And um, actually 94% of them had reported that they were attending the BSN program. And our largest group, it was the millennial group. 78.9% of them mm -hmm. were who responded to this survey in here. Um, so that's our next uh, steps is we are uh, going back to the IRB to request and uh, that, but we've had a change of the authors on there. So thank you very much. Are you next? Uh, I'd like, uh, I'm Joanne Long and this is Dr. Chris Hennington and um, uh, Chris and I spend a lot of time together on, um, we both enjoy statistics and we like to help students with those projects. And so we created a class uh, called Data Science. Uh, it's a postgraduate class, so you have to have a master's degree. And it was an experiment. And this was really based on the fact that uh, we have many, many changes with precision, health, and the human genome. And if you've been to the doctor recently, you know that that's informing practice at all levels. So we felt like it was important to begin to try and figure out how could we incorporate exposure to early elements of the data that's used in data, data science in our program. And so we created a class and had a small cohort of students uh, enroll. And but it was good, it was a good group. So Amelia was in it, um, so I think they enjoyed it. 
uh, you got a lot out of it. Yes. Data is scary when you're just looking at data and numbers and stuff. So we're, we hope to get them some exposure to that and get them more comfortable with it. Exactly. We have a big focus on just visualizing data and understanding that data, you have to look at it and get comfortable with it. So um, we spent a lot of time, and please jump in, Amelia, as, uh, as one of the guinea pigs in the, in the cohort. And then together, we put this poster together. We used a single focus group at the end. And um, you know, besides um, putting the course together using data science, we used a DNP textbook, a clinical a analytics and data management. And we used a lot of online resources that linked students to um, case studies, et cetera, that gave them a chance to experiment and play with elements that inform precision health. So anything that might relate to your DNA or genetics or genome, or simply a large database. And really we just played with it, we had some fun with it. <clears throat> One of the most meaningful things I think was that the students learned to work together at a higher level. Would you agree with that? Absolutely, and being able to use your resources other than just being nervous and afraid of not knowing things and knowing that there were so many resources available to you and actually going in and taking the leap and playing with things like SPSS and, and you know things like that. So it was it was definitely scary, but it was um, it was worth it. We learned so much and we learned so much collaborating with one another. And I might say a requisite to this was they had to go back and review their basic stats book and have a retake all those tests so that we started at the postgraduate level. I thought it was really interesting the benefits. Uh, students said they saw the value of data-driven decisions, of how to better support their claim or position with data, and a, a greater understanding of what we mean when we say big data and how do you s begin to start uh, to look at that and then independent thinking. One student said in particular they thought that data science would be what drove nursing to the next level. So, you know, we know that big data is complex and precision health is here to stay. And so this was our attempt to um, just experiment with how we might incorporate it into the curriculum. Uh, we're going to be adapting the class. Um, we've had two students go on to DNP programs that have accepted this course now. Uh, one in um, two, in, one in New Mexico, one in Colorado, I think. And so that was fun to see see them use it at the DNP level because it does coincide with the essentials. And uh, the highlight of this, besides the students, for me was I got a card from the director of the PhD program at the University of Pittsburgh. She stuck it on our poster and said, way to go, LCU. So that was a highlight for me. <laughs> yeah. different is we did not have poster presentations we had podium presentations so what I did was I took just a, six of the slides out of our podium presentation just to make a one single slide for you to look at while we talk these next three um, five-minute talks were a single symposium so we spoke <coughs> about Research Academy um, over three different presentations over an hour in Calgary so I'm going to start with I feel kind of blessed to be able to talk with the two um, leaders who thought up Research Academy in the room today. But Dr. Ashcraft and Dr. Long, um, about five years ago, came up with an idea to bring UMC, Covenant Health, Texas Tech University, and LCU together to increase the capacity in our direct care nurses to not only translate research, but to implement it and to understand it and really build on that ability to take what's there, those statistics that we just talked about, and make it practical for implementation into the care that we deliver at the bedside. At the time, Dr. Stinnett and I were working on our doctorates, and so we got pulled into this. Um, I was blessed to get to work alongside Dr. Long and Dr. Stinnett alongside Dr. Ashcraft. And we were the kind of their assistants um, for the first cohort of Research Academy. The first part of this is where we introduced that work that we did and what we learned and the outcomes from Research Academy. One of the biggest outcomes from the first cohort was Vern sitting here who introduced me. Vern led for state legislation change around synthetic drugs. 
So we had laws changed in the state of Texas from the first cohort. Second cohort you see here, I kind of highlighted the increase in the people that wanted to participate in Research Academy from both UMC and Covenant Health. Um, it was almost like we lit a spark in a room full of oxygen and, and the fire started. And we still see that now on, going on our fifth cohort. Um, but we really wanted to highlight the fourth cohort, and that's the next two presentations you'll hear, and the work and the lessons we learned from them. So we had talked about how do we get this to a final outcome where they're presenting, disseminating, writing abstracts, publishing. Really our goal was to get us to a final product that we hadn't quite gotten to in the first three cohorts. And so we decided to do it as a group. Why not answer a clinical question together? Because that's how I learned. Not that I didn't learn a lot from Dr. Ashcraft's curriculum design working on my degrees at Tech, but I also learned a lot from Dr. Long and working on the MUSE project at, at the point of research, you know, in a hospital. And so why not hand walk people through these skills? And so at first we kind of delegated out one of us that was doctorally prepared to work with them on a different part of the abstract. And it was very piecemealed and we heard grumbling and they called me into a room and said, hey, we just don't get it. We don't understand levels of evidence, first and foremost, and we feel like people expect us to know what we're doing, and we don't. So we took a step back, listened to their feedback, and decided that with at least cohort four, role modeling was the way to go. And so we did everything together. Um, we role modeled, like, many of them wrote their first abstract, many of them did their first presentation, and again, um, you get to hear some of the outcomes of that work. I'm going to hand it over to Amelia, or I guess you can introduce, sorry, I took over. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Amelia Garcia, I'm a nurse in the NICU at Covenant, and to just continue on to discuss about what Jamie was talking about, um, for the fourth cohort, what was really fantastic about it was that we had the role models with us. We had them right there at our disposal. So it was really, really, really cool to see EBP and QI coming to life because this is where we learned that you can have a question and how do you, how do you even start to answer that question? So we went to the literature together. We researched it together. We looked at the articles together. And then when they told us about inter-rater reliability and rating levels of evidence, you know, there were so many of us, I say so many, there was um, nine of us together, but everyone was at a different level of understanding. And so that was, it was so fantastic because we decided just to, let's come together and bring that knowledge together and share and figure that out. And so that's what we did. The inner rater reliability was, I think that was like the icing on the cake because so many lights just clicked on. You could see it and you're like, oh, I get that. Oh, you're getting that from what pyramid? Well, I use this pyramid. Oh, maybe next time we should discuss that we all need to be on the same page with that. So we learned about levels of evidence and we went through all of the methodology and just going through those things step by step and learning how to really do an IRR and to possibly find an answer to the question. For us specifically, we didn't very spot on find an answer to our question, but what we did find, we were able to make changes to our processes at Covenant Hospital, and so that's, it was just fantastic to see it all come to fruition in that co in that cohort and seeing it all come together and doing it together. So did the cohort do the same question that you do with transfusion? Yes, ma'am. So all 25 people, I'll make that up that number, did the same project. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And what it was it was very much team building, learning even how to synthesize um, together and learning the differences between syn syn synthesizing versus 
summary. Summarizing. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. Yes. And so that was another big, <laughs> another big life lesson. So it was fantastic. And that's exactly what the Indies like. Uh, it's that's wonderful mm -hmm. because as a researcher, Joanne, as a researcher, nothing makes us happier than somebody reading our literature, reading what we've written, and then putting it with everybody else's and coming up with a solution. And and that's that's the whole role of the D and D. That's why it was created. So I'm I'm excited. That's great. That's great. said a little something different. Each policy said a little something different. So we were astounded at that. How could that be? That's crazy. So um, we're the only ones that have a really an established policy, uh, nursing policy and procedure committee. So uh, we decided we would take this on and uh, with the help especially of Dr. Roney. We couldn't have done it without Dr. Roney as the DMP. And so once we had done all of this, this, uh, this work that they've just discussed, we sat down and we took our policy, and um, it it needed updating, of course. And so we went line by line by line. Seriously, it was like 20 pages. And so, um, and we compared it against the evidence that we had found. And three things emerged that we discovered was that um, we needed a, a respiratory assessment. We did not have a respiratory assessment when vital signs were done. When it was thought that the patient was having a reaction. Not only did we need a respiratory assessment, but it needed to include oxygen saturation. And uh, we also needed a physical assessment because what the literature, we found in the literature was that vital signs alone did not um, uh, show us that uh, the patient was having a transfusion. Uh, usually the patient was complaining first about symptoms before the vital signs changed. And then we realized that Another thing that emerged was the need for patient education. It was the it was the not only patient but family education that needed to know what to look for when they went home, or what to help report to the staff hours after that transfusion. So Can we said a respiratory assessment and a physical assessment. Yes. What's the difference between the two? Uh, the respiratory assessment is going to include uh, the O2 saturation, which hadn't been done before. Lung sounds listening to lung sounds. Okay. And the physical assessment? Uh, your, your vital signs would be your, uh, you know, just assessing, observing the patient. Um, anything else, Jamie, I can think of? I was gonna say, we didn't even have respiratory rate included, but even that pain was not included in exactly. the lower back flank pain with a reaction. So we included a lot of the physical assessment findings that we found were associated. It wasn't a full head to toe, but we create and we created it in our EHR, and I did not put that screenshot. But of the symptoms to look for in a focused, targeted uh, blood reaction assessment. So it really was a, a blood transfusion reaction assessment. Assessment. But it included physical. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You have all that. Yeah. Yes. And so we included that in the policy. We included a couple of charts that hadn't been there before that uh, came out of Crames. And so we took this through various councils, including lab, our executive councils, our, our nursing councils, and we, we sought approval. We got approval. Um, it was accepted. We moved on. And this was presented at, in Calgary. And um, so this policy now stands as is. And one thing that I think it really taught 
those staff nurses was that through role modeling um, and, and to sit down and how to synthesize, it really taught them a great deal about how to be change agents and how to get change accomplished through policy. And so that was exciting to see. From and how much time it took? So how much time did it take from beginning to end? Just the synthesis and abstract writing and presentation put together was over 48 hours. I'm talking about from beginning to beginning to end of the policy. Of the whole if you included it, probably a year. a year and a half, Jamie, I would say a year and a half. And then the hours of that. Yeah. And that right there, I think, is really important to know that, that although the changes, and I'll put this in quotes, look simple, a year and a half of work went into making it consistent, making yes. it all those to go through all the permissions for blessing, all that. I think that's really important that people understand it ain't going to happen overnight because they're like, wait a minute, hey, I'm just adding this, what's the big deal? Exactly. <laughs> One thing we, we learned is that the uh, policy was actually, uh, uh, had been uh, reviewed by the lab manager that dealt with, with blood administration, not even nurses. So, and it's nurses that do the administration. I can't even apply. So they were happy. That we uh, we took oh, it and we yeah, we it. It, it, it needed to be. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next. Well, I don't know, Angela. And I did not prepare together. I'm gonna let you do it. Okay. Thanks, Angela. I had the privilege of um, telling Angela's sister's story in Calgary, and talking about how it impacted the work that we do at Covenant. So one of the things we promise our patients is we're gonna give them evidence-based care and the best care known today. And what we do know through research is that promise is about 17 years behind in the care we're delivering and what we know we should be doing. And so I think envisioning this promise and realizing we had an ER nurse that had just had a baby and she told them, take me back to the ER. They'll know how to save my life. They'll know what to do. I'm dying of sepsis right now, and I need somebody to help me. Help me, help me, help me. And her cries to physicians and our colleagues as nurses went unheard. And she died um, on March 22nd, or April 18th, after having a baby on March 22nd um, from sepsis. And she was an ER nurse talking to her peers about what was wrong with her. Well, her sister comes to work in Lubbock, Texas from Canada at Covenant and is very passionate about sepsis, and I guess I am a little too. And so she's like, what can we do? We've got to do whatever we can to keep this from happening to anyone else. So at first, one of the changes we made is we followed each other in new nurse orientation. And so it got to where we transitioned. Angela would start introducing me by telling her sister's story to our new nurses that we were onboarding at Covenant Health and raising awareness. We also implemented a just culture approach at Covenant where we looked at was it a system problem or was it a personal failure? Because there's a big difference. If it's the system that set us up for failure, we really shouldn't punish anybody. So you really have to separate, was it a system problem or was it a personal failure when something goes wrong? And so that's part of having a just culture. We also took team steps and everybody was manda mandated to take team steps in our obstetric areas and our units. And we had 100% compliance with that. Now it's hard to measure the results of these few little changes we made in practice. But, so this is very, this is going to be your qualitative, like very low level, but we had two nurses that worked in our OB ICU, obstetric ICU, that saved lives based on what Angela and I had done. And fortunately, it was the same physician in both cases. And one of the nurses came to my office and couldn't work that unit again. Her patient ended up in the surgical ICU with obstetric sepsis. and. She felt comfortable enough to raise the flag. I know I can get somebody to listen. I'll go to Jamie's office. I take her to Karen Baggerly's office. Karen Baggerly takes us to Dr. Ryan's office. But we, got us, we, we hear each other. We supported her. 
Um, the other one, they did a Sentinel event, and she would not attend the Sentinel event unless I was at the table. I will not go unless Jamie's there. Because she knew I would have her back with the patient situation. And so we feel like that we had two examples of where our creating a just culture and creating a team steps could hopefully prevent what happened to Angela's sister and help prevent two patients from dying from obstetric sepsis. Again, very difficult to measure. We were reached out to after STTI by Michelle Fisher and asked to publish this. And so we are starting a manuscript publishing our work on creating a culture of accountability and openness. But I, I really think it focuses on an aspect of, of health care that we don't always acknowledge, where we judge our patients sometimes and or we don't listen to their full stories. And, and how can we, as, as a group of professionals, um, tackle that um, and those cultural issues within our facilities and organizations? Dr. Ashcroft? sad to hear what you had to share in one way, but in another way, because you are an expert nurse, you had that. And that's that I can't I just can't say enough because I'll do the same thing. I have enough experience, I've been through enough, I've been turned upside down, shaken down, and, and so I stand for those new nurses especially who need to know they're doing the right thing. And that's, that's a good thing. Now, what um, this team did, which was Carol Boswell, myself, Sharon Cannon, Pam DeVito Thomas, and Terry Delaney, as well as, I don't see your name on it. I think she just forgot my name. <laughs> <laughs> we, we went to Canada, and I have to say, like the rest of y'all, it was a great time uh, to go to Canada. Um, and what we did uh, at this one, we didn't present the results of our study. We presented what I call a pearl and a pitfall, or a pitfall and then a pearl. Sample size, uh, being able to get your sample size. You can see up there what um, the specific aim of the study was, but really one of the um, key pitfalls we had was obtaining, obtaining sample size. And when you do research, as all, all of you have learned in statistics classes, is you have to determine what's the appropriate sample size. What's the power? What's the effect? Remember those words? that you went, oh my God, please don't make me remember this, okay? <laughs> and you have to state, based on this, we're gonna collect the, the, this is our sample size here. And so, um, what we did was, our original thought was to sample registered nurses practicing in acute care in the United States, representing magnet rural hospitals and critical access hospitals. Power calculation determined that 740 individuals were needed. Originally, we sent emails to CNOs at the selected hospitals requesting their RNs to participate in the study. The, sample, the, the survey would only take about 10 minutes. However, 740 individuals, that's a pretty big number, folks. A pretty big number to obtain, and we did not obtain it. So we had to go back to the drawing board because we received money from Sigma Theta Tau and Sigma Theta Tau doesn't want their money back, although they would take it back. They want you to get your sample size. They want you to complete the study. So what we actually did then was um, went to a convenience sample. And what we learned that was really important was subject accessibility, availability, and cooperation. So we worked with other CNOs that we knew we developed relationships with. And they were like, oh yeah, I'll send it out in my um, institution. Our nurses are, are required to participate in research, so therefore this is something they would probably do. So relationships, I want, I want you to put that up there, number one, um, relationships. And then uh, professional networks, other CNOs who would assist, uh, if you're in organizations, asking people like, Okay, I know her, Luciani, some students. I'm going to come over here and ask uh, uh, my friends at LCU if students won't do X, Y, or Z. Okay? 
Uh, that's, that's one of the best ways. And then personalizing the request. We did end up giving a um, uh, mini iPad, I believe, for uh, an incentive, although I have to change my words now. It's not incentive, it's um, compensation for participation. <laughs> okay, that's the new word, two words. Anyway, so that's what we did to, um, you know me. I know. <laughs> Uh, so that's what we ended up doing uh, for um, to obtain a high enough sample, and uh, we did, uh, and moved on. But we did give a, an iP a mini iPad away, and I always question incentives, but um, I think they're good and they they can be valuable to use. So I think that's all my time. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hatch can't be here, so on his behalf, I want to say he did a very nice little study here at Lovett Christian, and using our own students, he um, looked at age, experience, <coughs> score on the HSRT and the GPA. And what he found was that GPA is the best predictor of family nurse practitioner success on the national exam in our own students, uh, using all the students that have attended LCU. So uh, he couldn't be with us today, but he presented that in Calgary and was real proud of the work that he did there. Do you know what the HSRT is? I don't have that in front of me, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, just wonder what it was. I suspect that's appropriate for also. Yeah, probably so. Uh, it's my privilege to say a word about an interprofessional grant funded study called Vocati, funded by the Lilly Foundation. And nursing has played a significant role in this project and is now the lead in this project. But we asked the question a few years back, thinking about our youth and the incivility and the high level of suicide. And essentially, uh, almost every youth that graduates from high school now says that they've been bullied at some point in time. I dare say most adults would say they feel like they've been bullied. And so, uh, you know, really thinking about what could we do about this as nurses, you know, and, and how could we work together with other disciplines? So our theologians and nurses um, piled up together and we said, well, what if we created an intervention that helped youth just to learn to think better? And we use theology as the vehicle. So we have them reading Socrates and Plato and uh, writings from great minds over the centuries. And uh, it's, it's very vast and very eclectic, and it, it's not all church related. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's the writing and thinking of great minds over the ages. And some are very old, and then some are very new. You know, we have them read uh, Glittering Vices from Kendrick Kirsten. Kendrick Percy Dean, you know, Princeton, and C.S. Lewis, screw tape letters. We use that uh, writing then to have discussions and uh, about well, what does it mean, centered around the three great themes of life, faith, hope, and love. Is there anybody that doesn't want to have a life that doesn't have those elements? We take them away to a summer intensive and then follow them for a year using social media and ask them other questions and get them to engage in dialogue. They create a project that reflects what they've learned, uh, and it's a mixed method study where we're measuring their moral reasoning. What we're seeing over time is that youth who participate in this program advance significantly in their ability to morally reason as compared to their national counterparts. We use uh, the DIT2 tool, which is an agnostic tool. It has nothing to do with religion or politics. It simply measures your ability to think about moral situations. And so what we're seeing is that this exposure to theological content in, in, in engaging youth in that helps them to learn to be better thinkers about society. Many of them have gone on to do very interesting projects, uh, re-roofing the houses of the elderly, just I could go on and on about the projects. And there in the middle we see also a number of pro-social, a movement in pro-social behaviors. So they, they learn, um, a number of things that are considered pro-social versus antisocial. We're very excited about the findings. We think that it has a lot of potential for helping youth to mature cognitively. And we just learned just about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, that we've been refunded by the Lilly Foundation for five more years through a sustainability grant 
which uh, we'll be looking for community partners uh, to help us um, to really strengthen the mind of youth and, and turn them, help them to make choices that enable them to be better citizens. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Melissa. Um, I work on the burn unit at UMC, and I did my IRR on honey-based wound dressings and burn patients. Um, I was just kind of curious if what we were currently using was kind of a gold standard or if there was something that we could be doing potentially better. So I looked at specifically honey compared to either a witch dry dressing or silver-based dressings, which is what we currently use. And so honey has been around since the dawn of time. We all know honey, we all know that it's, oh yeah, it's antibacterial, it's great. But there was some studies and some kind of rumors out there that honey is a really great thing to be able to use on wounds. And so I thought, well, let's look into see what other research has said about using honey-based wound dressing. So honey, as we know, is antibacterial. It also has tons of vitamins and minerals in it already in there um, for wound healing. So we see a lot of second, third degree burns. And specifically when you have a burn, your, that first layer is going to be taken away. So you, you, what you have is an inflammatory process and you're gonna have cellular swelling, which is gonna le lead to capillary leak. Um, so you also have a lot of fluid overload or fluid kind of coming out of the wound, which when we go to graft that skin, can delay that graft from taking and that wound healing once again and us furthering OR trips and, and higher risks for infection and lots of other things that accumulate. So what we want is to be able to allow that wound to heal in the way that it's supposed to stay dry so that bacteria doesn't have this great place to grow, uh, but also be able to um, ad adhere that new skin to the location. So uh, the methodology that I used, my official question was, uh, can the use of honey-based wound dressings in burn patients decrease wound infection rates and healing time? I looked at I believe it was um, Sinol, Cochrane, PubMed, and Medline using burn wound infection and human only articles. Uh, went through my entire system and came out with 13 articles. So, my literature synthesis essentially what it came up with was the most common issue with unsuccessful grafting, like I kind of already alluded to, was blood or fluid accumulation underneath. And they were finding that the honey was assisting in that attachment, that revascularization. It did not replace the need for any sort of skin grafting. So I'd like to be very certain about that. It didn't replace the need for skin grafting. It didn't increase the, the skin to heal on its own. But it did allow for a better attachment of that skin graft. And a less chance of that skin graft failing. Um, so the limitations that I found and the issues that I was finding uh, was really that there was only a certain amount of people out there that were studying honey. And there was a different variations of what type of honey they were studying. So there was people studying Manuka honey, which is out there uh, kind of popular right now. Um, was it, you know, different kinds of honey? Um, also, people were studying it in different forms. Are we putting it on the bandage directly? Are we just putting it on the wound? Are we taking straight honey? Are we filtering it? Are we sterilizing this honey? So there wasn't a ton of information out there that was specific enough to definitively say, yes, this is greater. But it, there was information out there saying that it is beneficial. However, I think the literature is telling us, let's just stick with this for now. We need more studies on what the potential for honey is out there um, and cost efficiency as well. We need to study the cost efficiency of honey based on what we're already using. So, so what do you do right now? In the Currently, we have multiple topicals that we'll use, so things, uh, depending on what kind of wound they have, so if they need to be a wound that's debrided um, and hasn't been excisioned or debrided already in the OR, we can put things like sulfa on it um, or plurigel. Um, if it's something that we have already grafted, we'll typically put neosporin on it. Um, or uh, Bactroban. on it? We do not put honey on it currently in the burn unit here. No, okay. we do not. I was yeah. because that's, that's interesting. Yes, um, it is. Some, I'm presenting this at the uh, trauma symposium on Saturday as well, so I'm kind of interested to hear Dr. Griswold's thoughts um, <laughs> on what he thinks. <laughs> Thank you. Good information. Yes. All right. He's over.
Thank you everyone for coming to this afternoon. I just want to remind everybody that the next research brown bag will be on Thursday, November 7th at 4.30, by back here in this room. Uh, it will be um, Kim Stunker.